get an introduction to the Thirty Years' War. The Thirty Years' War lasted 30 years. It's funny how they name them like that. Um, it started in 1618 and ran until 1648. It actually, this is a very complicated topic. Because, and I'll warn you up in advance. I'm going to oversimplify it. If we have any historians in the, in the audience, I will apologize in advance that I'm going to give you the much, much streamed down version. Virtually every power in Europe was involved in this war. There, it actually is not one war, it was a whole series of conflicts over 30 years involving many different military leaders, many different groups, organizations, etc. You sort of have to understand the setting for this. Um, in Europe, starting around 1300, they started having very weird weather. And what that means is it was colder, longer winters, much wetter. They had difficulty with crops. There was a lot of famine during that period of time. By the time they got into the 16th century, um, they had some areas that had prolonged rain that destroyed crops, other areas in, in Western Central Europe that had drought. Um, Spain, for instance, lost half a million residents to famine, famine during uh, this period of time. And then when we get into the 16th century, the 1500s, you have the upheaval of the, um, the Protestant Re uh, Reformation, so that you've got the Catholic and Reformation conflict going on, and that really is the start, as we'll talk about, of the Thirty Years' War. The situation prior to 1600 was so bad that there were a lot of prophecies that 1600 would be the end of the world, because they thought that all of the death and famine and conflict that had happened up till then were a fulfillment of the prophecies for the end times, and that 1600 would be when God brought an end to the world as we knew it. Well, of course, that didn't happen. We get into 1600, and because of a lot of the tension and frustration, both with uh, just survival and also with religious uh, conflicts, religion became very important to people, um, probably more important than it had been previously with, with the Protestant Reformation, because of the fact that people really were feeling threatened. They thought the world might end. They thought um, they, their religious attitudes had a big factor on that. So in the early 1600s, we, we have a conflict that starts with the Holy Roman Empire. And again, the Holy Roman Empire is something that people don't know a lot about. Before I introduce that, let me say, this is Europe as it exists today. Pretty straightforward. The boundaries are pretty clear, the borders. Um, there are somewhere just over 30 countries in Western Central Europe, depending upon how, how far to the east you go. So that's pretty straightforward. In 1500, this is what it looked like which you will notice that there were countries that were divided. There were sections of them in different places, that they were not contiguous to one another, it, and it was very confusing. Well, in the 14-1500s, one of the things that they did was they practiced a, uh, a, a kind of descent. Heirs, all of the male heirs in a family, particularly noble families, were given part of the property. That's not like what we're used to thinking about in more recent times where the oldest son if nobility would take over, and the others had to find something else to do. They would take, if there were five sons, they would take whatever the properties were and divide them up five different ways. So that by 1600, this is what it looked like. And a lot of these, this is small states, this is Swiss cantons, a lot of these are broken up into tiny little things. At this point, by 1600, there were over 1,000 small countries, duchies, principalities, counties, independent cities, self-determining villages. The technical word for this, historically speaking, is it was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> and the only way that a lot of these tiny, you know, self-sustaining villages or independent uh, cities could, could really work in the world was they depended upon larger powers to be sort of their international presence, to provide military support for them, to provide um, the ability to negotiate with other countries. And a major factor in all of that was the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire lasted for a thousand years. It started in 800 when Pope Leo III, now remember that it was a period of time in the, the first 600 years or so of the uh, Christian era that the, the emperor was in Rome actually up until 476. That was when the last Roman emperor was deposed out of Rome. But they continued to have Rome as a central area. And the Dark Ages came in. 
the Pope no longer had the sort of partnership and support of a political side, and so the Pope started taking on political power of his own. But there was always a sense in which they were better off when they had an emperor on their side. And so, in 800, Pope Leo III decided to create one. He uh, took Charlemagne, the fellow sitting here on the left, and much to his surprise, on December, uh, Christmas Day of the year 800, Pope Leo III announced that Charlemagne was going to become the new emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. He was going to resurrect this title. And so um, Charlemagne and a few of his descendants into the 900s, they continued as the Holy Roman Emperor. It sort of fell away for a while. And then we have this fellow Otto I. Otto I comes along in 962. He reclaims the title of Holy Roman Empire, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, and this continues until 1806. It's officially uh, shut down under Napoleon. But for a thousand years, this was the organizing force in most of Western and Central Europe. At its largest, this is what it looked like. The Holy Roman Empire was, uh, had only France to its west, to the east, it had Poland and Hungary, and all the way down to Sicily, with the exception of the Papal States, which the Pope maintained control of. So this was the organizing force. These thousand, by 1600, these thousand little tiny principalities and duchies and whatnot, they looked to the Holy Roman Emperor to be kind of the organizing force. Now, the emperor was elected. You will read in history, uh, you'll read about the elector of the Palatate or the elector of Sax Saxony. That meant this was a nobleman who had been given the authority to be one of the people who voted on the new emperor. So the, the emperor was elected, and that was critical. Usually, uh, by the time we get into the 1600s, they were part of the House of Habsburg and which was uh, Austria and some of Hungary, but there was also, the Habsburgs were also ruling in Spain. So they were ruling much of Europe as the kings of those areas, but also one of them was the Holy Roman Emperor. And so this, this created um, a lot of difficulties when people disagreed with the Holy Roman Emperor since he was an elected official. I mentioned the House of Habsburg. Uh, Charles V, which we have here, was one of the most important of the more modern of the, the Holy Roman Emperors. He was the one that was present during most of the Protestant Reformation. Because he was part of the Catholic House of Habsburg from Austria, he took it very seriously that he should be responsible for trying to suppress this new Protestant faith that came up. They had had a great many um, wars and struggles, you know, minor conflicts, major conflicts over the issue of the rise of this new Protestant faith, particularly Lutheranism. Luther was the one who started, Martin Luther's the one who started the Protestant Reformation. Well, Charles V took it upon himself um, to, when the Reformation happened, and he was, he was in charge of the Holy Roman Emperor, he's trying to suppress this. But every time he got ready to get his, his forces together to suppress the Protestant movement in particularly Germany, which was the largest part, well, we know of as Germany, the largest part of his area, um, the Muslims from the Ottoman Empire would attack again from the east, and he would have to go deal with that. This was a time when the, the Muslim armies were at the gates of Vienna for a number of years, and this was within his territory, and so he ha had to keep dealing with that, and the Protestant Reformation kind of got out of control. Um, he was unable to suppress it sufficiently, and finally, he, with the assistance of his brother Ferdinand, who takes over from him as the Holy Roman Emperor, they decide that what, what they need to do is to come to some sort of peace. And they actually do develop a, um, after, after declaring the, um, the Counter-Reformation at the Council of Trent, where they say they're going to fight back against Protestants, it gets so difficult that in 1555, um, Primarily Ferdinand, who was not yet emperor, but in, uh, by being designated as the one in charge of this by Charles V, he creates the Peace of Augsburg. And the Peace of Augsburg is basically an attempt to fight, stop the fighting between Catholics and Lutherans. Because Lutheranism was the only major faith at that point, uh, counter to Catholicism. And they decide that the rulers of the 224 separate German states, just in the area that was identified as Germany, there were 224 states, that the rulers in those states could choose which religion, Lutheranism or Catholicism,
that their followers would stick to and that their followers had to do that. They had to go along with what their ruler said. Secondly, a lot of the Lutherans um, were living in the Catholic bishoprics. They were allowed to continue to practice their faith. Some of the Lutherans had become Lutheran after being Catholic priests and bishops, and they had control of property. They were allowed to keep their property, but any that converted from that point on didn't get to keep their property. Now, you need to understand that bishoprics back then, in other words, the area that a bishop was responsible for, was meant a lot of wealth. There was a lot of money involved in this because it was property, it was farms, it was rent, and so this was a big deal. Who controls this stuff? The Lutherans and Catholics were fighting less over their religious beliefs than they were over who's controlling all of the wealth that the church had had prior to that time. As I mentioned before in, in the, one of the previous lectures, I often hear people say, you know, religion has been responsible for almost all the wars in history. Well, it's not really true. First, um, mostly it's been political power has been the motivation for that. And even the religions that start, or even the wars that start with religion, religious motivation, very quickly turn into an issue of political power and, and money. And that's the case with the Thirty Years' War. So they had come with a piece of Augsburg, and they thought that they had settled things down, and the Lutherans could be Lutheran, and the Catholics could be Catholic, but then they ran into a problem. And that is that another faith comes along, which is Calvinism. Yay, Calvinism. <laughs> I'm a Presbyterian, which is a Calvinist Reformed uh, theology, okay? So, um, it comes along, there had been no, um, no accommodation, no plan for how you're going to deal with anything other than Catholic or Lutheran. So all of a sudden the problem comes up again. And what you end up with is this. The lime green areas are those that are virtually entirely uh, Roman Catholic. The blue areas are those that are Roman Catholic with Lutheran, Calvinist, and even Hussite, the followers of John Huss, who was, uh, who was before John Huss, Jan Huss, who was before even uh, Luther. The uh, orange areas are those that are predominantly Lutheran, and the pink areas are those that are predominantly Lutheran but have Calvinist or Roman Catholic minorities. So it was no longer so easy as just saying, you can be Lutheran or you can be Catholic and then everything will be fine. The Peace of Augsburg did not allow for the complexity of the religious situation. And so they end up having more and more conflict. Well, finally, I'm gonna go back one. The Ferdinand I was prepared to allow Lutherans to practice their faith. Uh, his successor as the Holy Roman Emperor, Maximilian II, was a little more strict toward Catholicism, but he was prepared to compromise. Rudolf II comes along, he was a strange guy. In fact, he gets deposed because he, he didn't really follow Catholicism. He was more into occult practices um, and didn't like people. He pretty much isolated himself. And eventually his brother, Matthias, has him overthrown. But when Matthias is trying to have him overthrown, he issues what's called the Letter of Majesty, which says everybody can practice whatever religion they want, which was exactly what all the Protestants wanted to hear. Well, Matthias comes along and he is, he's struggling with all of this. He finally issues a statement that says, new Protestant churches cannot be built. And then he, his successor is Ferdinand II, who was an absolutely committed, pious Catholic. His knees were swollen from the amount of <laughs> kneeling and praying that he did. He was, he, he would submit to a personal um, uh, mortification because he was so committed to the faith and he absolutely believed that he had a responsibility as a new Holy Roman Emperor and he came in in 1617 to uh, get rid of all these other religious beliefs and make sure people came back to the one true faith which was Catholicism. Now in addition to be the Holy Roman, Holy Roman Emperor he was also the King of Bohemia and several other major areas and so Bohemia which we think of as uh, basically Czechoslovakia now, it's the Czech Republic, uh, it's, it's that area. When Ferdinand came in, the first thing he did, in fact he, he managed this before he even took over the throne, is he declared, because he was a nobleman there, that they had to, to uh, Protestantism was outlawed in Bohemia, the, the Czech Republic. So this is him with his little dog and his dwarf. Kings had dwarfs back then, okay? Um, 
craziness. Well, he declares, he sends two of his royal regents to Prague, the capital of the Bohemian uh, Principality, to enforce this new regulation that Protestants can no longer practice Protestant faith. They can no longer build any more Protestant chapels. They cannot proceed. Well, it was predominantly Protestant at that point. And so when those two regents show up and they're talking to the Protestant lords of Bohemia, the lords of Bohemia don't take it very well. In fact, we have an event called the Defenestration of Prague. You ever heard that? Do you know what defenestration means? It means to be thrown out a window. <laughs> Serious. And in fact, this wasn't the first time. There was a first defenestration of Prague in the 1400s, and now in the 1600s, we have the second defenestration of Prague, and it happened again later. That's what this is all about. The various lords, the Protestant lords who were there meeting with his regents, and these regents were saying, no, you have to do what you're told. You know, you, the, your ruler has said that you can't be Protestant anymore. You now have to become Catholic. So they throw them out a third story window, which is 69 feet off the ground. Now, the first defenestration of Prague in the 1400s, the people died. In this case, they were badly injured, but they didn't actually die. This is the start of the Thirty Years' War. When Ferdinand II, the Holy Roman Emperor, who is so committed to Catholicism, he says, you can't be Protestant anymore, and the Protestant lords of Bohemia throw his regents out the window of the, of the, um, the, the town hall. This is the building, the actual building. This begins the, the first phase of the Thirty Years' War, and I'm gonna way oversimplify this, as I said, and tell you it happens in four phases. In each case, while it started out just being in Bohemia, each case is an escalation in terms, or each phase is an escalation in terms of other countries being involved. So phase one, they throw the guys out the window, they are in revolt, and so Ferdinand, puts together an army. Well, they not only revolt, they not only threw the guys out the window, they also declared that they wouldn't accept Ferdinand II as the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire anymore, and they elect a Protestant, Frederick V, as the new emperor. So now you've got two guys vying for the emperorship, emperorhood, emperorness. <laughs> so the Battle of White Mountain is when the two armies come together. The armies of, um, uh, Ferdinand V, who was the new Protestant claimant to the Holy Roman Emperor, and the armies of Ferdinand II, who was the current Holy Roman Emperor. And they fight um, this huge battle at White Mountain, which is not far from Prague, and the Protestants are soundly defeated. They are way outnumbered, almost two to one, and they are soundly defeated, and they begin to enforce the um, Catholicism in all of the areas of Bohemia and all the areas these people controlled. And it looked like at this point, Catholicism had completely won and that everything was gonna be over, that the only thing that was going to exist was going to be Catholicism throughout all of the areas. And this was just the start because Ferdinand intended to spread Catholicism and make it the only available religion throughout the entire Holy Roman Empire, which again was almost all of Central Europe, as far, as far west as France and as far east as Poland. So this was not looking very good for the, the Protestants and their cause at this point. Well, shortly after this, various other in Northern Germany, Northern Europe and the Scandinavian countries, they had converted primarily to Lutheranism, but Calvinism was growing there as well, the two primary uh, Protestant denominations. And so they're really concerned that if, if Ferdinand II is successful in forcing all of the Holy Roman Empire to become Catholic, what's he going to do next? Is he going to come to Denmark? Is he going to come to Sweden? Is he going to you know, try to influence England? And so both for that reason and also for financial reasons, the second phase of the Thirty Years' War begins with what's called the Danish Intervention. This is King Christian IV of Denmark. He was a Protestant, a Lutheran. Now, his concern was uh, not only that he didn't want, because the Holy Roman Empire ran right up to his border, he did not want the influence of the Catholic emperor to come into his country, but even more so probably, 
he was very concerned to gain control of some of the trade in the Baltic Sea. You will remember my first talk on the Hanseatic League. It was around this time that the Hanseatic League was losing their influence and power. And so a lot of the major ports on the Baltic and a lot of, a lot of the major trade in the Baltic was up for grabs. And so because of all of the upheaval and everything, first the King of Denmark, Christian IV, felt like this was an opportunity for him to gain more power, more influence, while at the same time preventing them from suppressing Protestantism. So he invades Germany. He marches into Germany with his army in 1625. And uh, again, as a Lutheran, he claimed, he called for all the other Protestant powers to support him in that. Well, Ferdinand II goes to this guy, whose name is Albrecht von Wallenstein. He was from Bohemia and he was very wealthy. The way he had made himself wealthy is by, he was responsible for confiscating all the property of those Protestants. And by the way, 27 Protestant nobles were executed after um, the defeat of the Protestants at White Mountain. And so all of these guys lost their property. Their families were sent away. Wallenstein was the one responsible for this under Ferdinand II, and he made himself very rich by confiscating all the property of the people who had been against, against the emperor on the Protestant side. So he's very rich. The emperor gets him to be his general, and, there's, and he says, okay, there's, there's two conditions. One, I get to conduct the war any way I want, and secondly, I get to pillage as much as I want the properties and territories of the Protestants. And Ferdinand says, fine. Now this is important because the Thirty Years' War is, is probably known as having the worst atrocities and the worst conduct of military. Most of the armies that were involved were mercenary armies. And following Wallenstein's lead, they supported themselves by, by either um, extortion, forcing people to pay money as protection, or by taking their crops, or by taking their animals, by stealing anything that they wanted to steal, and they had a legal right to do so, according to Ferdinand, because he had agreed with Wallenstein that he could do that. Um, the other thing that happened is, not only were they, each army was stealing the stuff they thought they needed to support themselves, but then they would burn everything else so that the other side didn't get it. This is why eight million people died as a result. Not, most of them did not die as a result of combat, conflict, they de died as a result of what the armies did and also disease which came in at that point. So Wallenstein gets involved and he's got an army that's like a hundred thousand, it's almost four times the army of the, uh, the Danes. At first the Danish army is very successful, they take over uh, a lot of northern Germany, but then Wallenstein comes along, he, he agrees to help the emperor if he gets to, to just loot whatever he wants. And he's got an army almost four times as large. I think it was 27,000 the, um, the Danish had, if I remember correctly, and like 100,000 the Wallenstein. And so they really clobber the Danes. This is the Battle of, um, of uh, Vol Volgast, and this is an image of it as well. They completely defeat the Danish army in Volgast, but they're paying a heavy price as well. And so they finally come to an agreement. They have a treaty. They stop fighting. And um, Christian IV agrees to go back to Denmark on the condition that they leave him alone because uh, Wallenstein had actually invaded part of Denmark as a trade off. And so they agree okay, we'll leave you alone. You leave us alone. And the, the Danes are back in Denmark. That's the end, really, of the third, of the second phase of this military conflict. There are a lot of images of the various people. So that's the second phase. But again, there are other people concerned both about the being forced into Catholicism because a lot of Northern Europe and a lot of particularly Scandinavia had become Protestant by now. And so we get to phase three, which is the Swedish intervention. Again, we don't, Denmark and Sweden especially were two of the great powers of that day. Sweden had gone from being uh, very, you know, uh, agrarian, not having much money, not being very successful. They discovered a lot of minerals in their land in Sweden. They started trafficking or uh, uh, selling various kinds of minerals. They had gained a lot of money. There was a, a booming economy in Sweden, and they had become a major power. This is King Gustavus Adolphus, the king of Sweden. 
Well, he decides in 1630 that, again, in order to stop the suppression of Protestantism, he, and, and they actually call on him, some of the German Protestants call on him and say, can you help us because you're a great power, we're being suppressed and persecuted and tortured and tormented. So he agrees to come down, he leaves uh, Sweden, brings his army into the, the German territories. Most of this is fought in the area we know of as Germany. Um, he crosses over, enters here into uh, Mecklenburg, goes down through Brandenburg, and he ends up conquering almost all of Germany. Uh, he's very successful, and he does so partly because France is financing him. I mean, they, they, Sweden was very well to do, and they had a very powerful army, but in order to help with this, France was helping support the efforts there, which is very strange when you realize that France was Catholic. Eventually, the armies, the, the, the armies of Ferdinand, the Catholic armies get together, they end up defeating Gustavus Adolphus, not con conclusively, but he ends up retreating somewhat. The reason why Catholic France was supporting first the Danes, they supported the Danes, but then supported the, the Swedish Protestants in their war against the Catholics is explained by this map. This is Catholic Austria, which, was the, which is the Habsburg family. This is Catholic Spain, which is the Habsburg family. At one point, the two kings on the thrones of Spain and Austria were brothers. This area up here, the Dutch Republic is an area that was in rebellion against Catholic Spain. They had controlled it, but these orange areas here are still part of Catholic Spain. Where's Catholic France? Surrounded by the Habsburgs. And there had been a long competition for power between the Habsburgs and the royal families of France. And so the Bourbon families, uh, Bourbon families, excuse me, I'm from Kentucky, so Bourbon comes out naturally when I try to say that, <laughs> Bourbon families. And their concern was that if Catholic Austria is successful in taking back, or Spain is, takes back the Dutch Republic, and the Holy Roman Emperor, who is from Catholic Austria, succeeds in controlling all of Germany, they're gonna be completely surrounded by Habsburgs, and they are more concerned about that than they are about Catholic versus Protestant. At this point, it very clearly becomes an issue not of religious difference, but of political power, and of being able to maintain the political power that you have. So, um, this by the way, this is Cardinal Richelieu. Any Three Musketeers fans? I don't mean the candy bar. Three Musketeers in terms of the movie <laughs> stories, all that. This is the period of time of the Musketeers. This is the time of Louis the, Louis the 14th and of Cardinal Richelieu. Cardinal Richelieu, who is Chancellor of France, he is the one that had been giving money to support first the Danish Protestants in their battle against the Catholic Habsburgs, and then to the Swedes in their battle against the Catholic Habsburgs. And so we get to phase four, and that is after Gustavus Adolf, uh, Gustavo Adolphus is defeated, and is sort of pushed back. He's not completely destroyed, like the Danes uh, had been pushed back entirely, but he's, he's taken a big step back. Richelieu decides it is no longer sufficient for them just to finance other people who are fighting the Catholic Habsburgs, like Denmark and Sweden, but he actually has to get involved in fighting themselves. And so France enters the war in 1635. They had been paying for much of it prior to that anyway. This is also the period of time, now interestingly enough, at the same time that Cardinal Richelieu is funding the Protestants from Denmark and Sweden and fighting against Catholic uh, Habsburgs of Austria, they are also suppressing the Huguenot Protestants in France. They began to try to suppress the Protestants in France, the Huguenots as we know them, um, and in, in doing so, the Huguenots responded to the first suppressions by arming themselves. And they had been given several fortified cities, like uh, this is the assault of, of uh, La Rochelle. And the, in some of the Three Musketeers movies, they're involved in battles against cities, which, you know, the Musketeers are on Richelieu's side, even though they don't like him, he's the bad guy, right? But they're still on the side of the king, and Richelieu is the is chancellor of, of France. And so they're fighting against these Protestant cities. At the same time that Richelieu was trying to to destroy the Protestants in France, the Huguenots, he's also funding the Protestant armies 
from other countries and then later actually invades Germany with his armies, although the French armies were not very strong at that point. They sort of relied on being able to pay for stuff because they were very rich. One of the concerns they had was Spain. Spain and France were great competitors. I mean, they didn't like the, um, the Austrian Habsburgs either, but Spain, because they share a border, Spain and France always had a problem. And one of the reasons why Spain had a difficulty with France is they had uh, lost their northern areas. This Dutch Republic, this had been part of Spain and they had rebelled. Well, the difficulty was in the late 1500s, the Spanish Armada, remember what happened to the Spanish Armada? The English destroyed it, even though the Spanish Armada was larger, which meant Spain could not get up here to try to take this back by sea because going through the English Channel, the British wouldn't let them. You know, any, any Spanish ship that showed up was for sure gonna get clobbered by the English. So the next thing they said, well, in order to try to get these territories back, then we need to go over land. We need to take our army over land. Well, what's in between them and these territories? Their enemy, France. And so there was a constant struggle to try to find some way to get their armies. And they had various roads they tried to get over into, into various areas, but it was a constant struggle between France and Spain during this time. And this was a big part of the difficulty that they were having. And so France comes into the battle, in, in into the war in the, in 1635. So the French intervention Eventually, the, the Catholic military, well, actually, Ferdinand II died. Ferdinand III, his, his son, who takes over as Holy Roman Emperor, he said, for 30 years, we've been destroying ourselves. We have got to find a negotiated treaty at this. And so he pushes for them to find a negotiated treaty. Unlike his father, he was very willing to allow certain religious freedoms. And so um, eventually, we end up with this map. Now, you'll, you would have noticed earlier that at first the Holy Roman Empire was all the way down here. It took in Sicily, it took in Sardinia. It was everything except these papal states, and it went over this far. By the end of the Thirty Years' War, it had been much reduced, the power was much reduced, and in effect, the Holy Roman Emperor became nothing more than a figurehead. And so for the last um, 200 years of his existence almost, the Holy Roman Emperor was, was like the Queen of England. You know, everybody acknowledged that, that they, were, they were not only in charge, but had almost no authority. You end up with the, um, see these United Provinces are no longer a part of the Holy Roman Empire. That's what we know of as the Netherlands today, the Low Countries. And so eventually they began to get their independence. To give you some idea how many people were involved, in, how many countries were involved in this, these bars uh, show the black means those who were directly for the emperor, Ferdinand II. Well, obviously the emperor was from the, for the emperor. And Bavaria, which was owned by the emperor, Saxony, the red are those who were absolutely against the emperor. So Saxony was for him, then against him, then for him. The Pat Palatinate, which was one of the areas, major areas, were, was against him. The uh, principalities of Hesse Castle were uh, against him, then sort of against him, and then very much against him again. And they switch sides, but you get all of these, Brandenburg, Russia, the Dutch, Denmark, Sweden, France, England, Savoy, Transylvania, Spain, the papacy, and Poland, all of them were involved in this war. And it was a devastating event for all of Europe. As I said earlier, one of the big problems were the mercenary atrocities. And in case you can't tell, that's a large tree with a lot of bodies hanging from it. These are soldiers looting houses uh, and looting wagons. The cruelty and greed of these mercenary soldiers was unlike anything that anyone had ever seen. Just the Swedish army, and the Swedish used mercenaries as well, mostly German mercenaries, some Scots, some Danish. They were responsible, the Swedish armies destroyed 2,000 castles, 18,000 villages, and 1,500 towns. They destroyed, burnt to the ground, one-third of all the towns in Germany. The entire regions were devastated. During the sack of Mecklenburg, which the Swedes um, performed that in 1631, of the 30,000 uh, citizens in the town, only 5,000 survived. 25,000 of them were killed. The, 
it was literally rape and pillage and rob, and they had permission to do it in order to support themselves. And this is how their leaders were making themselves wealthy and how they were able to recruit mercenaries. Anything you can take, you can have. It's also very weird that at this time, there was a huge focus on finding and burning witches. It's often the case when there is great trial and trauma, people look for somebody to blame. Whose fault is this? And so they managed somehow to figure out that it was the presence of, because the start of this was a religious issue, that there were witches involved. And when I talk about it in the um, one Lord Abbot of Fulda, Balthazar von Birnbeck, great name, but unfortunately he was responsible for burning 250 witches at the stake. The reason that they burned witches at the stake is they believed that if they destroyed the body by fire, the soul would still survive. If they just killed them, then the soul would be damned as well. And so they burned them. In um, Würzburg, 900 people, men, women, and children, were um, killed as witches. In Bamberg, 600 people. It was an extraordinary byproduct of this that people, uh, people in authority were looking for somebody to blame for the famine, for the disease, for the war, for the complete lack of control that they had. And so they looked to people who they believed might be witches. This shows, this chart shows the percentage of loss of life. The red areas are where they lost 50% of the population during the Thirty Years' War. The purple area is 41 to 50 percent. The dark green area is 21 to, to 30 percent, 11 to 20 percent, and then up to 10 percent. It's um, many of the German states lost as much as 50 percent of their population, as this indicates. Almost all of the areas, and some of them more than that, Bert, the uh, the Württemberg area lost three quarters. Three quarters of their people were killed. It's estimated overall that half of the men in the German territories died because of this. And um, in the Czech lands, uh, in the, which was Bohemia and surrounding areas, that one third of the people died from war, disease, and famine. In addition to the war and to the famine that was caused because of all this destruction, disease, pestilence became common. The people from other countries were coming here to fight as mercenaries, and they were bringing diseases with them that people weren't used to locally, because people didn't get around a lot then, you know. So we have examples of not only typhus occurring, but bubonic plague, massive problems of dysentery and people dying from dysentery. It was a horrific time, and it changed all the face of Europe. Eventually, they say enough is enough. Ferdinand III, the son of Ferdinand II, who, who created the, the basis for all of this, he pushes for an agreement, a settlement, and they actually have a whole series of different treaties. They, if you think of them all together, they call it the Peace of Westphalia. The Peace of Westphalia took four years to hammer out with various contracts and agreements in which they finally said people can practice their own religious faith, but they still, the significant parts of the Thirty Years' War in terms of the long-term imp impact is previously it was believed that the church, the Catholic Church, and especially the Pope, was at least equal to the emperor in being able to tell people what to do. The Thirty Years' War removed the, the political aspect of people's religious beliefs. It was after the Thirty Years' War, it was understood that people have an obligation to follow the laws of their political leaders, usually kings and noblemen, before they do anything religious, that the religious is much more personal, it is not a public issue, it's not something you fight wars over or try to force people into. This was a major change. Calvinism, Lutheranism, and Catholicism were all recognized as legitimate faiths under the Peace of Westphalia. And there was a huge reorganizing of the different borders and different powers. France emerged as the preeminent power in the European continent, whereas Spain, who had been the most powerful before, Remember, their mighty armada had only been destroyed about 25 years, 30 years before this. Um, they really lost power. Portugal declared their independence and took with them some of their territories in the New World, like Brazil, which is why, of course, Brazil speaks Portuguese, because they were a Portuguese colony. But Spain had control of all of that. They uh, took that away from them. Um, it's Portugal did. The Dutch took some of the properties away from Spain. Spain really diminished in 
in power and authority, and France became the preeminent power in Western Europe. Sweden also increased even in power and authority. They were recognized as a major military power and a financial power. Uh, there was a realigning of the various divisions within Germany. In some cases, they broke up into smaller pieces, but in other cases, they were united. And so there was very much a reorganizing. I mentioned France's growth in influence and power. This was the start in, in 1643, not long after the, the end of this, um, they, or, or during this actually, uh, Louis XIV took the, took the reins of, as king of France in 1643, and he started the longest reign of any monarch in European history. He ruled from 1643 to 1715. This was the golden age for them. You know, he was the, he was the golden king, the sun king. And so um, it was fundamental changes. The, the role of religion was different. The role of politics was different. Who was the power to really look to were different. The boundaries had all changed. All of Europe uh, changed at this point, but it took them a very, very long time. Um, some estimate it was at least 100 years before many of the devastated villages and towns and cities regained their level of population or their ability to support themselves. So this is the 30 years war. I'm gonna put that up so I don't forget it. I always forget it. Questions about this? The 30 years war, I actually did this in 44 minutes. <laughs> 30, very, comp and it, when you start reading this stuff, you start reading about the 30 years war, it is so many names and so many battles and so many treaties and so many issues, it is very complicated. So forgive me for oversimplifying, yes. Uh, what was going on with non-Christian minorities? There weren't any non-Christian minorities. Um, the uh, the Jewish people, I mean, there was a Jewish faith, and the Jews um, had been, for the most part, um, in, in fact, Rudolf II, I mentioned, he was the sort of quirky one, the one who issued the letter of majesty that said everybody had a right. He did specifically acknowledge Judaism as well. For most of the other, you know, the uh, Judaism was the only exception. Everybody else was considered Christian, unless you were Jewish. Now, the, it was just, and it's, this is the time when Christendom, the political entities and the religious entities were overlapping. And if you, like I said, the, the uh, Treaty of Augsburg said, if the ruler decides they're going to be Lutheran, then everybody is a Lutheran. People didn't get to opt out, and so no, I don't believe in that. You know, and so the assumption was everybody was either Christian or, uh, or they were Jewish. So the question was the Christian side. Now, the Jews for the most part, 30 years war, I'm not aware of any major uh, oppression of the Jewish people during that time as had happened at, at other times in the history of Christian Europe. But um, they were recognized as being separate. And Rudolf II acknowledged them as being a legitimate religious option as well. But then they, they actually imprisoned him and he kept him in because he was just a strange guy, and he was doing all sorts of things to give people freedom that the Catholics, you know, his brother, and uh, didn't want. So, yes? Is Great Britain stay totally uninvolved in the 30 years war, both financially and militarily? They were involved in terms of, of giving, in, in fact, if I come back here. Okay, you'll see that England is here, they were against the emperor, very much against him in the, in the 20s, um, rather against him at other times. They did not get involved with military, uh, unless there were some mercenaries that may have come over from England. I know there were Scottish mercenaries, for instance. Uh, but they did not support. Now, they had become entirely Protestant. You know, they, and so that's the reason why they did not support the idea of the Holy Roman Emperor forcing anybody else to be Catholic. Now, they weren't Lutheran or Calvinist or Catholic. They were the Church of England, the Anglican Church. You know, um, Henry VIII created his own flavor. And so that didn't really jive with anything else. They didn't get involved in the conflict, but they clearly were saying, we don't like the idea of Catholicism represented by anybody, the emperor or the pope, trying to force people to follow, because they've been through that in the 1500s. You know, they, they went through that where, you know, Henry was created a Protestant church, his son Edward, uh, heir was Protestant, then his daughter Mary was Catholic, and they were having conflict over all that. She was Bloody Mary because of her persecution of the, of the Protestants, and then Elizabeth I came along, and Elizabeth was a very smart lady. Elizabeth took the Church of England and made it look Catholic, but have Protestant theology. 
This is why the Anglican Church today is considered a Protestant church by most, uh, but it looks Catholic. They have bishops, they have priests, they have you know a high service liturgy, that sort of thing. And so she helped quell all of that by making it look Catholic, but having it based upon a Westminster Confession, which is Protestant. Okay. Yes. Well, there, it was obviously from Scandinavia, they, they had to use naval forces, and all of the Scandinavian countries and the Netherlands, so Denmark, Sweden, the Netherlands, all had very significant navies. The Dutch ended up, along with uh, Denmark somewhat, taking properties away from the, uh, some of the other powers, like Spain, because of the power of their navies. At one point, the Dutch had the most powerful navy going. At the start of the Napoleonic War, one of the things Britain had to do is they sailed up to, to Denmark in order to destroy the Danish Navy because after they had already destroyed the French Navy, so Napoleon couldn't use them, Napoleon had designs on going up and stealing the Danish Navy, and so the British went up and destroyed that those ships so they couldn't take them. So all of these countries, especially the Scandinavian countries and the Netherlands and England, all had very powerful navies, and so they had the ability to transport themselves uh, that way. But it, you know, when, obviously when they got on land, they had to use uh, land forces. Yes? Were the Ottomans stacked or still contracting during the period? Actually, the Ottomans were involved. Uh, and, and if you look at this chart, uh, does, I thought it was on here. The Ottomans were involved because the, um, and they supported the Protestant side. They provided uh, money and some of the very sort of border areas, they actually uh, participated early on in, in militarily supporting the Protestant side. The reason was because, as far as they could tell, their opponents was the Holy Roman Emperor. He's the one that kept coming to defend Vienna against the Ottoman Muslims. He was the one that kept, you know, keeping them from taking over more of Europe. So as far as they were concerned, anything the Ottomans could do, sort of like the French, anything the Ottomans could do, to suppress the power of Catholic Habsburg was in their best interest. And so they did so by financially, and in small ways, uh, militarily, supporting the Protestant efforts in the Thirty Years' War. But not to a, not to a large extent. You had your hand up. Yes, I wanted to ask whether the Swedish invasions of Poland were part of the Thirty Years' War. They ended up taking over part of Poland and also part of Finland right around that time. I mean, this was part of their sort of expansionist effort. Uh, because Sweden, in well, I won't flip back through these, but if, if you look at some of the maps of that time, um, Finland was was owned by Sweden. They were part of the northern areas of Brandenburg and uh, whatnot. They were owned by Sweden, and so in many cases, one of the reasons that they got involved as well, like the the King of Denmark, Christian IV, he actually was the um, was the technical ruler of one of the German principalities, and so he felt kind of an ownership to that as well. So yes, um, Sweden did expand in those ways. Yes? Just a comment, we end up in Stockholm and they have the Vasa Museum. Okay. It's a 400 year old warship that came back office built for the Thirty Years' War. Right. And it's absolutely fascinating. Great, so the Vasa Museum in Stockholm, where they have a 400 year old ship that Gustavus, Gustavus Adolphus used in the 30 year war. Any other questions? Yes. Sorry. Here first, and then I'll get back to you. Yeah. So with all this conflict and destruction, did humanity progress at all? And did we learn anything? Well, by the way, this is the most devastating war until World War II, um, you know, in terms of overall devastation. Um, I don't think we've learned anything <laughs> myself. I mean, the human nature is still human nature. We primarily, now again, so many people will tell me, well, religion is the cause of all of the conflicts in history. And it's, that's not true. It's usually political power. And the ones where, where religion is, and the Thirty Years' War started out of that, it's not people with very rare exceptions. It's not people going to war to try to force someone else to, to follow their religion. 
Charlemagne did that some. He forced Christian conversion. But it's usually people who are willing to fight a war in order to keep their religion from being taken away from them, which is what happened here. The Protestants were willing to go to war in order to keep from being forced to follow a faith they no longer believed in, which was Catholicism. Um, and that's much more common, where when you do have religious wars, it's people fighting to defend the, their right of self-determination. So some of it's religious and some of it's probably just a matter of personal desire to have self-determination. But, um, you know, I'd like to think we learn things, but people are... I don't believe people are fundamentally any better right now than they were in 16... 40 or in you know 292 or anything else we still have the same appetites we still have the same desire um, you know the, the the motivation to rape and pillage uh, I actually had a discussion with a couple a Dutch couple uh, not too long ago they were saying well people are fundamentally better now than they used to be and I said no they're not we just have better police forces we have created means to control that but given the opportunity, we see it over and over again. We see it in the Pol Pots, and we see it in the various other tyrants. Given the opportunity, the, the, you know, the, the Holocaust, the horrendous devastation that human beings will cause, given the opportunity and the lack of controls. So I wish we'd learned something, and maybe someday we will, but I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a realist about that. Okay. Yes? Moving forward today, when can we expect the next 30-year war to What's today? Um, when will we have? When can we expect the next thirty-year war against the Muslims? I have no idea. Um, I'd be writing books if I if I knew the answer to that, you know, and making a lot of money selling them. But um, you know, the world is always going to find a reason for conflict, whether it's you know, a religious motivation or whether it's because some people are so convinced that they are right that they're willing to do things that we consider unspeakable, you know, like uh, some of the terrorist attacks that we've had. But, you know, that's not new. I mean, the, it's in, we, we, look at, we look at Muslims today in terms of how the very small minority, and I teach, I, I do lectures, I teach courses on comparative religion, and Islam is a big part of that. Um, and so, yes, there are people that take that to the extreme, and they do horrendous things. I don't, I don't think there's any way we can, and I'm speaking as a Christian pastor, that we can paint all of Islam with that brush. It's simply not true. That, in fact, um, my lecture on Islam, which is online, I had a Muslim student who's in China from Bangladesh. He's doing PhD work in China, and he he watched the video and he wrote me a wonderful email saying that I had taught him things about his own faith because he felt Muslims don't really understand their faith, they don't understand other faiths. And he said, you remind me of the statement in the Quran that says that Christians are unbiased and willing to seek wisdom from all sources. There is a statement in the Quran about that, about Christians. And he said, I'm going to share this with some of my friends who are Muslim who don't really understand their own faith, and I have bought two copies of your Christian Bible because I want to read them. I feel, you know, I always say that if, if I... My beliefs can only be legitimate, I, be, I think, I can only be honorable, if I also make a really significant effort to understand what other people believe. To be able to say, here's what I believe. Others have a right to believe whatever they want. And I, you know, this is an example of what happens when you try to force people to do other things. But I need to know my convictions are based upon a, an understanding of what other people believe and a respect for that. Um, and so I, I think that's where we have to go. Whether we are going to have, uh, I don't think we're going to have a war against Islam because the number of people in Islam that are actively aggressive in that way is very, very small. Um, and I, I have friends who lived in the Muslim world for many, many, many years, and they say this is not what we see all the time, not what you see on television. So I don't think we will have that war, but if we are going to, I have no way to predict it.